Good. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm muted as usual. So, okay, I'll say that all again. Um, I was thinking today what I would do is I would do the first recursion lecture, and then um, maybe next time what I would do is I would do a lecture on classes and file input output, um, because in this online teaching format, I'm kind of I'm kind of slow, as it turns out. I don't go over nearly as much material as I usually go over in person. Um, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't exactly have full understanding of it. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, so... Huh. Well, yeah, I guess. Anyway, so I'm going to do recursion today. Then we'll do file input output uh, and maybe a little bit of classes next time. And then we'll do more recursion maybe the next week. So I'll switch the order of the lectures just a little bit just so that we can have basically a complete set of like introductory recursion lectures and then introductory class lectures. Um, maybe it'll even break up the recursion stuff a little bit. So who knows? So, okay, let's begin. Um, you don't have to worry about this slide, really. This is just all the things we've done up to this point. Uh, homework 6 is next. Project 2 is a week after that. Oh, wait a second. I think... I think, actually, I might have... I might need to tell you guys some bad news about the scheduling of the course. Um... Let's see here. So project two assigned. Yeah, so I think um, Yeah, so they're both going to be assigned this week at the end of the week. Um, I might, do we have to do four projects instead of two now, no. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, just the, just the way that the schedule works out, there was, I think it all, really the problem is that the um, beginning of the class, if you remember that stupid half week we had, it kind of counted as a week, and so since nothing was assigned that week, um, it caused some issues with the with the assignment due dates. Normally, we don't do that. Um, what I might do, and what I'm probably the secret is that we're probably going to extend uh, project two, so we'll probably extend uh, project two, and. So when we extend project two, then we'll also probably extend project three. So we'll push those, we'll give those into the final exam review period and exam a little bit into the exam week. Um, yeah, so unfortunately that's, that's probably what we're gonna have to do. Uh, the issue is just that there's no, that we need one more week in the semester and it just doesn't exist. Yeah, the homework will be assigned at the same time, but it'll be due in one week, and then the project will be due the next week. Um, I'm trying to write it so the pro project two is going to be a lot shorter than project one. So hopefully that'll be good. Okay, so let's get to recursion. So what is recursion? And the idea of recursion is that uh, it's the idea of self-reference. So in mathematics or in, in um, computer science, the normal way we talk about recursion is that a um, 
you know, a, a function will call itself. And so I'll show you what, what that means in a bit. Um, inductive proofs, uh, so proof by induction in mathematics are, it's another example of kind of a recursive process. Um, there's some recursive acronyms out there like GNU. Um, if you ever heard of GNU, it means uh, GNU is not Unix. So the, the first letter of the acronym stands for the acronym itself and the N stands for not and U stands for Unix. And the same thing is true for uh, the Python package installer. Um, uh, it stand, it PIP stands for PIP installs packages. So um, basically uh, every, every time you see PIP, it just means PIP installs packages. And so you can kind of work, uh, you know, you can say PIP installs packages, PIP installs packages, installs packages, PIP installs packages, installs packages, installs packages, right? So you can always unpack the PIP into another PIP installs packages. Okay. So recursive is a, a process is a process which calls itself during the execution. Uh, the main idea is to break each problem, and well, this is more of the idea of problem solving using recursion. But sure, the main idea is to break each problem into one or more subproblems of smaller complexity and to solve them. So the way you think about it is that. If you're going to think about a recursive solution, you would always think about it in terms of saying, okay, I can understand a subproblem, but I don't understand the whole problem. So can I break down the problem a little bit into a smaller problem that I can then solve? Um, so it's an easier, I shouldn't say an easy. Uh, it's an easier way. It's a, sometimes it's the only real way to handle algorithms with which branch. So for instance, if you were gonna trace your way down, um, let me actually just draw it out. So if you're actually gonna trace your way down a structure, um, like this, So this is one of the most common things in the universe, unfortunately, at least when you get to data structures, is a binary tree of some sort, where basically each circle represents a place you can go, and each edge represents, um, basically it represents a, uh, a path to two new nodes. And so basically you, you know how to go down, and you know how to go in left and right. So you can either, when you're here, you can either go left or you can go right and um, et cetera. So let's, you know. So basically, when you get to future classes in computer science, um, and of course I'm not gonna draw this perfectly because I need a lot more space. The problem is you need exponential space as you go down. There we go. And then this one's going to be wonky because it has to be like this. There we go. This one has to be like that. And now if you start here, the only real way to trace through this place is recursively because you'll have to the reason why you need a function that calls itself is because the question is like, do you go down this path or do, or do you go down this path? And the answer is actually both. And then when you're here, the an the question is, do you go down this path or do you, go, do, do you go down this path? And the answer can sometimes be both. And then do you go down this path or this path? And the answer is both. And so in order to be able to 
go down every possible path, you need some form of recursion because whenever you reach a node, the answer is always the same. It's if there's some children to the node, if there's some way to go down, you have to call um, you have to call the function again on the left child and the right child. And so this kind of structure is something that you're going to see in the future, most likely. Um, and the basic, so there are some ways to deal with this non-recursively, um, but the standard ways to do it are recursive. Other things that you kind of need recursion for are, um, are like maze problems and stuff like that. Um, sometimes there's not really a better way to uh, kind of like the RoboVac problem. If the RoboVac were smarter and didn't just get stuck, um, then you would probably have needed to do it either recursively or using something called a stack, which is actually uh, a tricky way to get around the recursion because you're actually shifting the recursion into something else. So anyway, so here's, here's a function. Um, let's code this function in. Uh, where is PyCharm? Hmm, good question. Um, no, that's here it is. Okay. So um, So if X is bigger than zero, uh, we're gonna return point blah, of x minus 1. So this is a standard type of recursion t uh, problem. Um, and then else, we're going to return 0. So yes, to some degree, yeah. They, uh, um, the, the Python definition of functions is very similar to the mathematical definition of functions. Oops, well that didn't help. Okay, let's, let's debug this thing. Oh wait, but I didn't actually run it. Um, let's do pointless recursion on five. Okay. All right, let's, let's try it again. Okay, so what does recursion even do? Well, that's the whole point of this lecture. Can I increase the font? Fine. Um, so, do you need to, don't you need to print to see what's happening? Uh, no, we're going to be doing debugging, so just wait and see. Okay, so if, whoops, I think that was the wrong answer. So here we're going to step, I think this is step into, yes. So we're gonna step into the function, you see x is equal to five, right? And you then will step into the function, so x is bigger than zero, so it's gonna call pointless recursion on x minus one. So then what we're gonna see here is, what are we gonna see? So we're gonna see in the recursion stack, so watch what happens here. PyCharm shows us here, we have a version of the function that's sitting here waiting for this function to return where it's called on pointless function of four. And then here's pointless function of four. It's checking if uh, x is bigger than zero. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna return pointless function of three, which is now gonna check if x is bigger than zero. And then it's going to call pointless uh, function of two and pointless function of one. And then finally, x is equal to zero. So if you look at and see what's happened here, there is, basically, there is a, a call to the function where x is equal to zero. There is a call to the function where x is equal to one. There's a call to the function where x is equal to two, three, four, and five. And so all the way down here, when the call is equal to zero, then what's it going to do? It's going to say, okay, is x bigger than zero? It's not bigger than zero anymore. Now it's going to return. So the question is, where does it return, right? And it's gonna return up one level, or I guess in this case, it's gonna be down one level onto the stack. So you see that here, the top level thing right here on the stack is the one where x is equal to zero. The one right below it 
is where x is equal to 1. And that function is waiting at the return statement. So, um, so once this function returns, now you see that the function disappeared off the stack because the function where x is equal to 0 returned. Now we're in the function where x is equal to 1. It's sitting at the return statement. Now it's going to return to the function where x is equal to 2. And now it's going to return to the function where x is equal to 3. And it's going to return to the function where x is equal to 4 and x equal to 5. And then finally, because we call pointless recursion on 5, it's going to return and terminate the program. And that's the end of it. So we see what happened. What happened is basically we created five copies of the function. Each copy, or I guess technically six copies of the function, each copy had its own value for x. So I guess the way to think about it is this way. We had like pointless recursion on 5, and then we had pointless recursion on 4, and then we had pointless recursion on 3, and then we had pointless recursion on 2, pointless recursion on 1, and pointless recursion on 0. And so the way to think about it is that, uh, let's see here, let's equally space these so they look better, and then do that. So basically what happens is that this function was waiting, oops, for this function, right? Uh, let's see. Object faster, I think it is. So this function was waiting for this function. This function was waiting for this function. Uh, this function was waiting for this function. Uh, this one was waiting for this one. And I guess I need to space them out a little bit more. And this, then finally, this one was waiting for this one. So that's how, that's how they were working. And so when it returns, so remember that this is going to return 0. So then the bottom one returns 0. So let me see if I can. Isn't there like a foot vertical? I think there is. Yes. Whoops, not everything. Not everything, just this. There we go. So the first thing that happens is that this function returns 0. And then once this function returns 0, this function is going to return 0. And then this function is going to return 0. And then this function is going to return 0. Then this one. Then finally this one. And then that's going to end, end our recursion. Now. How do they all know to return 0? Well, that's because there's something called a base case, right? So in every recursion that you're going to do, um, yeah, so this function returns 0 to here. 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 And this function finally returns 0 to here. Um, well, it doesn't return. So. Uh, okay, so let's do a better example of recursion. So let's do one that actually computes something. So here's the little diagram again. So let's talk about n factorial. So this version of n factorial is actually a recursive definition here. Well, that's the point of this lecture. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial, except for if n is equal to 0, in which case we just define it to be 1. Well, the good news is that this is not a series, it's a product, right? Because n factorial is equal to... The way to think about n factorial, right, um, so n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, um, right? Basically, it's equal to this. Almost there. Okay, there it goes. So here's n factorial in general. And so for for example, uh, here's some examples of n, of uh, factorial. So if you have like say uh, zero factorial, that's defined to be one. Um, one factorial is actually defined to be 1, because it's just this last 1 here. Um, 2 factorial is equal to 2 times 1. Um, let's see, 3 factorial is equal to 3, 3 times 2 times 1. Uh, which is equal to 6. Let's see if this works. Well, kind of, almost, sort of, kind of. So, so let's look at some more examples. So four factorial is equal to four times three times two times one, which is equal to 24. Let's see if I can get the alignment better. So 5 factorial is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 120. 6 factorial, for instance, is equal to 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, etc. What is he typing? He is typing factorials. That's right. No, I did not. No, I did not. Here they are. See, and now they're nicely aligned. So, so anyway, so this is the definition of factorial. Okay. So, how might you do this recursively, right? So there's a way to do it iteratively, which means using loops, but there's also a way to do it recursively. And so, actually, let me just save this so that it is saved. Let's save this as uh, recursion. Okay, just in case the computer crashes or something. So here's the recursive definition. Basically what it's saying is that n factorial is equal to n times whatever n minus 1 factorial is. Otherwise, it's just 1. So how do we make this into an algorithm, right? And so basically, here's how we do it. We can just code up a, a recursive factorial. And the way to code up a recursive factorial, um, let's say recursive factorial of n, it's basically going to be if n is bigger than 0, you return recursive factorial of n minus 1. But we need to do something to that first. We need to say n times 
uh, that. And then you're going to say else return one. Right? So that's the that's basically the trick. So we're going to pretend that any time you call recursive factorial on a negative thing, it's OK to just return one. Let's not worry about recursives on negatives or anything like that. Or uh, yeah, so so you see what's going to happen here. So let's recall a recursive fact on uh, say five, and let's print it out. And so actually, what I'm going to do in order to make this more visible is I'm going to set uh, temp equals to this. I'm going to print temp, and then I'm going to return temp. And so the only reason why I'm going to do this is so that you can see the order in which the recursion is being called. Um, it's not technically, none of, none of this is technically necessary. Um, why is that in n factorial, it has n minus 3 times n minus 2 times n minus 1? Uh, that's part of the definition, right? So n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 all the way down to 1. OK, so let's step into this recursive function. So here we see n is equal to 5, so it's called n uh, recursive factorial. And so what's going to happen is n is bigger than 0, so then we call temp equals n times the recursive factorial on n minus 1. So let's see what happens. So now it calls recursive factorial on 4, because it can't evaluate 5 times. Remember here, n is equal to 5, so it can't, uh, could it just loop infinitely if it's done wrong? Uh, technically, yes and no. Uh, Uh, let's see, does it look okay for me? Oh, it is a little pixelated. That's unfortunate. I guess it's just bad bandwidth or something. I don't know. Um, hmm, it says excellent connection. I'm not sure why it's doing that. <laughs> okay. Well, let's keep moving. So, all right. So anyway, so first it's going to print out. Okay, so first it printed out. Um, actually, I don't think it will print out anything yet. Hmm. Why is it printing all, all that? 1, 2, 6, 24. It's already printed out all the factorials up to 4. Hmm, interesting. OK. So then here, we're at n is equal to 4, so it's going to print out that. And then it's going to print out. So you see that here it changed n to 3. And now it changed n to 2 because we called recursive factorial on n minus 1 or on 3 minus 1. So now it's 2. And so now we're going to call it on recursive factorial of 1. And now we're going to call it on for recursive factorial of 0. So now we're in a different situation. OK, so I guess it just kind of pre-printed that stuff. That's weird. Anyway, so. Um, Okay, so the idea here is now we're at the base of the recursion. So that's the whole point of recursion, is that you have to think about the base step before you can uh, think about the recursive step. So this is the recursive step here. And then here's the base step here. And the reason why this is the base step is because you see there's no recursion in this step. And so that's basically all the differences. So the recursive step, um, come on. has some recursion. Uh, the base step doesn't have recursion. Okay, 
But now what's going to happen? So n is equal to 0. So what it's going to do is it's going to go to the else, and it's going to return 1. OK, so how is it going to return 1? It returns 1. Now we're in the n equals 1 function. So we went back up one level. And so now we're in the function where, remember, recursive factorial of 0 just returned 1. So now we're in this case where n is equal to 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. Uh, and without else return one, uh, no, um, because it will return none instead, and then none plus one, or none times one equals one. So, uh, well, I've kind of given you some examples of what you would use recursion for, but let's step through this example. So. Okay, so there we go. We print a 1, and then we return that. So remember what gets returned here. So what gets returned here is 1, and so then recursive fact of 1 is 1, and now we have temp is equal to 2 times 1. So then temp is going to print out 2, and then it's going to return 2. And so now we're in the n equals 3 step, so 3 times 2 is... 6, so temp is equal to 6, and then it prints it out, and then it returns it, and so now we're in the n equals 4 step. 4 times 6 is 24, so you see that the temp variable is 24, because the thing that came out of recursive factorial was 6, uh, And then the last step is the n equals 5 step, where what you're going to do is you're going to say 5 times, and remember what returned from recursive factorial of 4 is 24. So then 5 times 24 is 120. So it's going to compute it, and then it's going to print it, and then it's going to return it, and then it's going to print it one last time. So if we look at the console, that's what we see. Um, this is some weirdness. So ignore this part here. Uh, I think... So just pay attention to this part here. So here we get 1, 2, right? So this is uh, basically 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 4 factorial, 5 factorial, and then 5 factorial again. And so that's what's going on here. And so, you know, you can call this on, say, recursive factorial on 17, and instead of debugging, let's just run it. And what you'll see is that it's going to print out. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's that's almost certainly what happened. Um, you see that it didn't do the it didn't print the things uh, again uh, when you just run the code. Like if you just print it, if you just run recursive, you see it doesn't print the other ones. It's just some glitch. I don't know. And it doesn't matter. So basically here, um, we see that we have 1, 2, 6, 24, 7, 20, 5, 40, 43, 20, uh, etc. And so we see that we, we just get a bunch of different factorials all calculated. And then the last one gets reprinted because remember, we're printing the answer here and then we're returning it, and then there's one last print statement here. So that's why these are duplicated. So, th uh, so this is 17 factorial. OK. But you might be asking, hmm, like, what's the point? What's the point of all this? Because I can come up with an iter uh, factorial that does the same thing. Uh, Yes, that's exactly correct. So if we debug this thing again, we can even show you. Oh, but pass. Um, so if we debug this thing again, I can even show you what happens. So you see 
that here, every time I click, you're going to watch as another uh, recursive factorial is created on this line. And so you'll see, I'm just going to click through. And so this is what's called the recursion stack. So there are different copies. Uh, yep. And so there's different copies of the recursive factorial function, right? So here we have the one where n is equal to 17, and that's waiting on the recursive factorial of n equals 16. And that one's waiting on the recursive factorial of n equals 15, and 14, and 13, 12, 11, uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And then here's the one, and then we have one more because remember we have to get all the way down to zero. Yeah, happy new year, exactly. And so here, this is now going to evaluate to false. So this prevents us from going through an infinite recursion. And so now we're gonna return one. And so now you're gonna watch as the recursion stack kind of goes backwards and evaporates. So what you're gonna see here is that here it's gonna return one and then it returns one, but remember here, this is a different recursive factorial call. This is where n is equal to one, not where n is equal to zero. So you're gonna get one times one, and then you're gonna get two times, uh, basically I'm just clicking through, and you see every time I click through, it, uh, yeah, 10 equals six, 10 equals 24, 120, 720, 540. It's going through each of the recursive calls backwards in the reverse order, uh, or, yeah, in the reverse order that they were called. Would an infinite recursion return zero? Uh, no. So um, this is what an infinite recursion does. And of course you might be like, well, that's a stupid infinite recursion. But here's an infinite recursion. Um, and you'll see what it does in just a second. Basically, Python has an approximate limit. Um, the approximate limit is about 1,000. I think it's like either 999 or exactly 1,000. Um, sometimes it'll stop at around that point. Um, basically, the idea, I should really just call this infinite recursion. And so the answer is that this is going to re return a recursion error. So now you might be asking yourself, like, what's the point of recursive factorial? Because there's actually a better in, uh, iterative solution. So for instance, if you just define uh, iterative factorial like this, and now, you know, so there's an iterative solution to it. So basically all you have to do is you set uh, total equals, um, or you can just set like fact equals one um, for i in range uh, one up to fact plus one, um, fact times equals uh, i return fact. So this is a totally, and then I guess what we can do here is let's move this code down. Um, and you'll see that like if we print out, you know, a bunch of um, let's actually remove the print statement out of here just just for now. So if we remove the print statement out of here and we say um, something like this for k in range 10, uh, print this, then what we can get here is uh, nothing. Ah, okay. Okay, there we go. There we go, better. Um, so, so this is a, this is generally, um, a better solution because it doesn't involve recursion. Um, but let me show you a problem where, at least as far as you know, you have to use recursion, right? So, 
So basically you're like, well, now what's the point? Because does every problem that has a recursive solution also have a better iterative solution? And the answer is no, it doesn't always. So, um, so this is basically what I've been showing you. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the terminology again. So the recursive case is any case which subdivides the problem and makes a recursive call. Uh, the base case is the terminating condition. Basically, it's the way that you have to stop the recursion. If you don't stop the recursion, then you end up in an infinite recursion, uh, which will actually be stopped by Python. So Python uh, is kind of safer than some other languages. So in, for instance, like in um, C++, for instance, or in C, what's actually going to happen is what's called a stack overflow and it's just like the website. Um, basically what happens is that you're creating so many copies of the function and each one of those copies takes some space up in RAM because it has to store like the return address, all the variables, any, any in local variables, any calculations that are done. Basically it has to store all of that somewhere so they all get stored in RAM um, on the stack and then as the functions are getting called more and more of these uh, function calls are getting layered on top of each other and if you just never stop that process, eventually um, what generally happens is your, pro your computer doesn't run out of RAM, but the, the program will run out of allowable memory space. So for instance, like if your program is allowed to use two gigabytes of RAM by the operating system, you'll just fill that two gigabyte slot up and then the operating system will be like, no, 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 you can't have any more. Um, you don't, you're not allowed. So in modern computation, uh, you're saved from the computer just absolutely crashing. Your program will crash, but usually the operating system will save you from an infinite recursion. Um, like in the very early days of computing, you know, before operating systems were a thing, um, then or before you know memory space was a thing, um, you could definitely just exhaust all the memory on a computer and just crash the system. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's there's reasons why it won't that kind of like the worst case scenario of just absolutely crashing the computer won't happen, but the program will definitely crash. So yeah, if we don't have something to kill the recursion, we will descend forever. But that's actually not really true. As I said, eventually you'll get either a stack overflow or a recursion error in Python. Um. Uh, So this is similar to an infinite while loop whose condition is never false, right? Um, but the problem with an infinite while loop is that, for instance, unlike an infinite recursion, an infinite while loop is actually worse. Um, I like can't stop, won't stop, right? If you do something like this, your computer is actually happy to just do this forever. And the reason that this is the case is because what's happening is you're printing, uh, what's happening is that basically you're, you're calling this function, but this function is not recursive. So this function is not going to, um, it's not gonna cause additional memory to be allocated. So what it does is it allocates the memory, it prints out the thing, but then it deallocates all of its memory because it doesn't recurse. Um, and so the thing is here that, uh, yeah, exactly. There's nothing that's being stored before you go into the while loop again. The next time you go into the while loop, it creates this string again, which is being stored, and it calls the print function, which is being stored in RAM. But then after the print function, it releases all that memory, and then it goes back into the while loop with the exact same amount of memory, theoretically, unless there's memory leaks, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, as it started with. So that's the thing, you'll never exhaust your memory. And so it doesn't care that you're just doing the same thing 100,000 times a second. Um, this is just, gonna happen forever and the reason why is because you're not actually exhausting your RAM whereas if you did the infinite recursion with uh, can't stop won't stop it will only print it like 900 and whatever times right well so the nice thing about it being printed on the screen is actually How can you increase? Um, 
Well, so if a program is a 32-bit program, it can only have four gigabytes of RAM maximum, and that's just because its memory addresses are only big enough to handle uh, four gigabytes. If it's a 64-bit program, then it can handle essentially as much RAM as exists in the known universe. So um, in Python, I don't know if there's a, I think there might be ways to do that, but I would not, uh, I would not go looking for it. The, the right answer, if you're getting recursion errors, is not to increase the amount of RAM that goes to your program. Um, so yeah, so this will go more forever. Okay, so here's an example where, again, for all you know, you have to, well, actually there is an iterative solution, but I'm gonna pretend like you don't know that right now. Um, so let's pretend that there's not an iterative solution to this. So the, the Fibonacci numbers problem was originally stated in terms of pairs of rabbits. And so each pair of rabbits takes one month to mature to breeding age each pair of rabbits will give birth to a new pair every month once mature and rabbits are immortal. So that means that we don't have to subtract any dying rabbits at any point. So for the first month, they're young rabbits. For the second month, they're mature rabbits, but they haven't given birth yet. So in the third month, they're gonna give birth. And so then you'll have one pair of rabbits from the previous month plus the new pair. So then you'll have two pairs of rabbits. But of course, one of them is um, immature, I guess you would call them. And so, let's see. Yeah, and so then the next step is you have one, actually, let's just draw it out. I think it's best to just draw it out. Um, uh, okay. Um, right, so let me, let me pull up something and we can just draw it out. I think maybe in, uh, as long as this is, yeah. Okay. Basically, let's just do it here in Notepad++, the best Notepad in existence. So here, uh, let's call these young rabbits, and then here we'll call them mature. And so in month... Month one, we have one pair of young zero mature. In month two, we have zero young one mature. The total is still one. In month three, we have one young one mature. In month four, this pair matures and they give, so this gives birth to one more and this one is, uh, this gives birth to one more, and this young pair becomes mature, so we have two and one. So for a total of, I guess, three is the total. Here the total is two, here the total is one, here the total is one. In month five, we had two mature pairs, so they'll give birth to two young pairs. We had three pairs, and then we'll get five. In month six, uh, these two mature, so we have five total here. And remember in the previous month we had three mature pairs, so we'll have three. Total we have eight. Month seven, we have, uh, we'll have five new pairs, eight and 13. Um, and then the last month, I'll, eh, maybe I'll do one or two more months. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, so these five mature, so all 13 are mature now. Uh, we're going to get eight new pairs because that's the number that we had in the previous month. And then here we get 21. And so basically here's the point, is that the Fibonacci numbers, F sub n, are these values here. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Okay? So, um, yeah, so basically the way to think about it is that 
here you notice that in the previous month, what we're doing is actually we're adding like the total from the previous month plus the total from the previous previous. So here, this one is equal to eight plus five, this one is equal to five plus three, this one is equal to two plus one, this one is equal to, well, one plus zero, I guess, because there's nothing over there. So, um, so yeah, so basically now we want to do this recursively and then we'll do it iteratively. So let's do this both ways. So here is the math, the recursive mathematical definition for it. And so the recursive mathematical definition is actually a little bit, it's good, but it's going to be a little bit problematic because, uh, Fibonacci. Okay. Well, actually, we can just. So, the good thing about it is that we can actually just directly implement uh, this into code, right? You can say if n is equal to 1 or 2, return 1, right? If n is in, say, 1 or 2, return 1, else return, and then here's our uh, recursive case. And so we can return recursive Fibonacci on n minus 1 plus recursive Fibonacci on n minus 2. And so this is the point, right? This is the whole idea of the way recursion is going to work. And so let's, let's just have a little while. Um, let's say x is not equal to minus 1. And so x equals int input. What bit number do you want? And so then what we'll do is we'll call recursive and we'll print. Uh, okay, so uh, recursive Fibonacci on X. And so this is the this is like the short version. The longer version is that what we're going to do here is we'll say um, and then we'll say uh, let's say a is equal to this, print calling Fibonacci on n minus 2, and then we will say b is equal to this, and then we'll just return to a plus b. Now this isn't actually changing anything. You notice that this is doing the exact same thing that we did, that I was doing in the one line. It's just kind of splitting it up into a whole bunch of different lines so that we can see what's going on. So let me run this thing. Whoops, oh yeah, what Fibonacci number do you want? Uh, let me change that, uh, let's see, console font, uh, font. It's down here in console font. Let's compute the Fibonacci number of, say, one. Cool, one. Let's compute the Fibonacci number of two, one. Cool, so that's right. And also it stops, so that's nice. Let's uh, compute the Fibonacci number of 3. So what is 3 going to do? 3 is not equal to 1 or 2, so it's going to call the Fibonacci number on 2 and the Fibonacci number on 1, and it's going to return 1 both times, and then we will see what happens. So uh, let's hit it, hit it. So there it goes, calling Fib on 2, calling Fib on 1, and it returns 2, so that's right. Let's call Fib of, uh, let's see, 4. So fib of 4 should call fib of 3 and fib of 2, right? If I enter 0, uh, won't it break? Yeah, probably. So, so when it calls Fibonacci on 4, you see that it's actually going to call Fibonacci on 3. But then when it calls Fibonacci on 3, it needs to call 2 and 1. So, and then uh, when it calls, and then here's the second one, right? So this is the one where it calls Fibonacci on 3, branches down to calling it on 2 and 1, and then uh, it calls it on 2, like that. So let's call it on Fib of 5. So here it's going to call it on 4, which is going to call it on 3 and 2. Um, Fibonacci of 3 is going to call itself on... Um, I guess one and two. And then this is what the second call is. So I have an idea.
This might help us see who is calling who. Whom. Whoa. Okay, that's uh that's too much. This is the danger of the recursion. Let's call fib on four again. So here we see that three calls it on two and one, and then here's the separate call for two. Let's call it on five. So here's four. Four calls it on three and two. Three calls it on two and one. Here three calls it on two and one. Right, so five, Fibonacci number of five is the same thing as Fibonacci of four plus the Fibonacci of three. And when it's called on two, why didn't it call on one? Because that's part of our base case, right? I, I assume that both of these things are in our base case. Right, if n is equal to one or two, we don't call the previous step. So let's call Fibonacci on six. So here we get Fibonacci of five plus Fibonacci of four, but then we have to compute the Fibonacci on, well, because three isn't in the base case, right? So because here three is not in this list. Will recursion be on your next homework? Hmm. Homework six is the recursion homework, so, so yes. So here, what you do is you say calling Fibonacci on five. So this is calling on four, calling on three, finally calls on two and one. And you know that whenever it calls on two and one, it gets to stop. And so that's why when it calls Fibonacci on two, it doesn't call it on one and zero because that's a base case. Calling Fibonacci on three, calling on two and one, then it gets to stop. Fibonacci on four calls three and two. Um, three calls two and one and gets to stop. When you call Fibonacci on two, it gets to stop. Let's compute the Fibonacci number of say 10. Or let's compute uh, eight because it should be 21. And you see that there's a lot of stuff here, right? Basically, first it's gonna call it on seven and then it's gonna call it on six but you see the problem here. It's redoing these calculations a billion times, right? So, um, so we don't want to be doing that, right? Like that's not uh, that's not the way we want to live our life. And then again, you might see something like if you accidentally called it on the number, say, one hundred five, um, it's just going to just explode, right? It's just not going to be happy. And the reason why it's not going to be happy is because uh, this algorithm actually has a, uh, well, an exponential runtime. I shouldn't say it's an exponential runtime of 2 to the blah. It's an exponential runtime of actually golden ratio to the blah, where golden ratio is slightly less than 2. But the point is that this, this is going to take probably, I don't know, I'm just guessing, like longer than we have to live to finish. Um, so the good news is it's never going to hit the recursion limit, I don't think, because will it actually finish? That's a good question. What I call it on 105? It's never going to hit the recursion limit because the recursion, the number, the depth, the maximum depth is going to be uh, like 105 is the max depth, but then 2 to the 105 is big, and that's kind of the number of steps that we're going to take. So 2 to the 105 is 2 to the 105 is this. And so that is, I promise you, this is going to take us longer uh, in terms like then uh, this is going to take us longer than you have and I have and our children and our grandchildren have to live. So we're not going to, so we're going to kill this program. Um, let me show you two ways to fix this problem. Uh, this is in like 
this is not in seconds, it's in steps, but you can basically pretend that a modern computer, at least in Python, can take about a million steps per second. So you can divide this number by about a million, and now you have the number of seconds. So this is divided by 60, divided by 60, divided by 24, divided by 365. Um, and so it will take uh, this number of years, which is what, 100,000 million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, uh, uh, pentillion or something. So it will take at least 1.286 pentillion years. So that's significantly longer than the universe has existed um, by a factor of, you know, a trillion or something. So, you know, let's, let's not do it this way. So there's two ways to resolve it. So the first way to resolve it is to, is to do a little trick. So let me do the little trick. Okay. So this is going to, I'm going to call this dynamic. Uh, this is using a technique called dynamic programming. What we're going to do is we're going to create a uh, list of previous solutions. Okay. Actually, I'm going to create a dictionary of previous solutions because I feel like it. And watch what I'm going to do. So basically, if n in previous solutions return previous solutions on n else do this but then the point is that what we're going to do is as we compute these things we're going to say um, if n minus 1 in, uh, not in previous solutions uh, brief solutions on n minus 1 is going to be equal to a. And the same thing, actually, we can make it even more efficient if we flip it this way. And so what this is doing is it's going to remember all of the previous solutions to this problem. So. Um, as we go through, if it's in the previous solution, then it's just going to return it instead of recomputing it. Um, and so let's do it. Let's do this one. Actually, let's print out um, print out the cursive on uh, n here. That way, it'll tell us all the recursive calls it's doing. Okay, so let's see what happens. What Fibonacci number do you want? Let's try one. We got one. Try two. Try three. So it did a recursive on three. Let's try four. Oh, wonderful. Oh, because it's. Wait a second. No. What a. Why is it trying to do that? Why is it trying to do that? Oh, because I didn't change the, the this recursive function is calling the wrong one. Okay, better. Let's try recursive on four. There we go. And you notice here that it didn't do the same thing that it did on um, four before, because on four before it called a bunch of extra calls. And so now five, it's gonna call recursive on five, four, and three. Here we can call it on 6, 7, 8, 9, and let's try the real one, 105. There we go. Recursive on 105. And basically most of the time was probably spent in these print statements. Right? So we see that that's a way better solution. But there's also an iterative solution to it that's a bit simpler. So. Let's let's write down the iterative solution. So the rule for Fibonacci numbers, remember, is that you just have to re remember the two previous values. So we can just call this f prev 
uh, equals one and f uh, pre prev equals one. And then we can say for i in range, and so let's say uh, two up until, or I guess three up until n plus one. And remember, the reason why we're starting at three is because f of zero is equal to one and f of one is equal to one. So now we're going to start for, ah, okay, so we should start at two. So f of two is going to be equal to two in this case. Um, and so what we can do is we can say value equals, or actually what we should do is we should say, um, so we'll say current is equal to f prev plus f pre prev. And so now what we can do is we can say, um, hmm, hmm. And then what we do is we say um, f prev is equal to current, or f prev prev is equal to f prev, and f prev equals current. Does that work in that way? So we set the previous one, the previous previous one, and then we set the previous one, and then we can just return a current. Okay. Current, let's just say current equal to one, just in case uh, we don't enter that for loop. All right, so let's see how much I screwed up on this function. Um, so let's do it. Well, let's let's try it. So Fibonacci on five. Okay, it looks like I'm going one too far. So I set this one to zero. Oops. Ah, oops. Uh, let's try Fibonacci at five. Hmm. How did I do it here? Oh, I think I did shift it incorrectly. So let's see here. Let's do Fibonacci at five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, one of five. Okay. So that's basically done it. Um anyway, so this is this is the iterative solution. There's not always an iterative solution to a recursive problem, but in these in these basic cases there is. The the primary difference between factorial and Fibonacci, which is the whole point of this lecture, is that factorial uh, was iterative, uh, not iterative. Factorial was basically a single uh, branching of recursion. So, and uh, Fibonacci was a like a true what I call branching recursion because each Fibonacci call had to call both Fibonacci on n minus one and uh, Fibonacci on n minus two. It's running both. So, okay. Cool, so here's the recursive function. Um, Oops, shouldn't show that. So let's do one last example. I'll code it up pretty quick. So I guess the question is, what is a palindrome? Uh, so a palindrome is a string that occurs the same ways both for, uh, forwards and backwards, like, for instance, stack cats, gnu dung, taco cat, and pup, aha. A uh, race car without the space, Doctor Awkward without the period and the space, I guess, etc. Right. So here's a bunch of palindromes. 
basically uh, a palindrome is anything that looks like ABCBA, right? Or ABCDCBA, etc. Um, is there a way to do palindrome checking recursively? Ooh, what's happened? Okay. And the answer is yes. And so it's going to be an example that uses slices. And so I'm going to show you the example. And the reason why I want to show you the example is because, not because it's the best solution for palindromes, but because it's the solution that will kind of allow you to understand a little bit about how the recursion is working. So for instance here, um, so let's think about it. Um, so how do you check for a palindrome? So you check for a palindrome by making sure. Um, so AAAAA would work in our process. So just think about it this way. If you want to break it down into a shorter problem, what you can do is you can always check the first and the last characters. If they're the same, then uh, strip them off and uh, keep going. Uh, otherwise, it's not a palindrome. So basically, if the first thing in the string, a string 0, is equal to a string minus 1, which represents the, so a string uh, minus 1, remember, is a negative index. It represents the last element in the string. Um, so also, we need to do one other base case. Let me show you that other base case. Uh, before I get on to this one. The first base case we need to do is we actually need to check if a string. And the reason why we need to check is because a null string is a palindrome. Okay, now you could have technically defined a null string to not be a palindrome, uh, but in this case it's nicer to define it to be a palindrome. Like, is the question is, is this a palindrome? right, a, an empty string? And the answer is you kind of want it to be because if you have a, a, b, b, a, a, and then you strip off the a's, and then you strip off these a's, and then you strip off these b's and they match, and then you ask, is this thing that remains a palindrome? The answer is yes, right? Because, um, because the point is that uh, this matches oppositely, right? The, the reverse of the string is the same or whatever you want to say. So basically the idea here is that um, because this is a palindrome and because we know that it's about to reduce to the empty string in the end, um, we want that to match. Okay. Yeah, so if the first and the last thing, shouldn't you change the second thing to L? Technically, you don't have to, but yes, I'm going to, I'm about to do that. Um, that's the other problem. Yes, if you don't check if a string is empty, then this will be an index error, right? Because uh, index errors will happen if you don't do this. Technically, you could have left this as an if, because if this is true, it'll return and you'll never get to this if statement. But I tend to like to do this as an elif, just because it makes everything feel a bit safer. So then, and so else we're going to return false, right? Because they weren't equal. This is not a palindrome. And we'll just print out a string is not a palindrome. And so um, here what I'm going to do, now we need, so you notice we have two base cases in this recursion. We have the base case where the a string is null, and we have, um, Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. If not a string. So now what we have to do is we have to make the recursive call. So now we have to say return recursive uh, palindromes on a string. And so we have to make a slice. So the slice is going to be we slice from the first character up to the last character. And remember, a slice uh, takes the first element, uh, so the element at 1 but not the last element at minus one. So basically, it's going to strip off uh, the, 
all the first and last character. Okay, so let's see what we got. Let's print a string while we do this, just so that we are happy. Um, Um, <laughs> S uh, let's see, compute a uh, recursive palindromes on S, uh, print. And we'll print that off in the end. Okay. And then we'll get a new string. Otherwise, we'll get an infinite loop. Okay, so let's do this. What Fibonacci do we want? We want negative one because that'll get me out. So let's do race car. And so you see what race car does is it says R-A-C-E, so it strips off the R's because they match. It strips out the A's because they match. It strips off the C's because they match. We get down to E, and then it returns true. So let's do another string. Let's say A, B, C, D. Well, let's say A, B, C, D, A. So it'll match on the first ones, and then on the B and the D it won't match. So it says... A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, but then it says B, C, D is not a palindrome because it got to this else statement here, and then it returned false. And now it returned false up to the function call that had already stripped off this one. So, um, so remember that there was already the function call that had the whole string. Now there's the function call that just has B, C, D, and then there will be the function. It, technically, there would be more function calls. So taco cat. Um, what are some long palindromes? Let's see. Let's see. Okay, a nut for a jar of tuna. I guess it is. Um, sure. Ooh, I guess I might have had a typo in there. Um, yeah, so a man, a plan, a canal. So that is one. Um, yep. Uh-huh. So... Let's see, um, I guess borrow or rob is, is one. There you go. Um, and of course now, um, you know, here's some things that aren't palindromes. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, completely not a palindrome. Um, a, 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 So is this a palindrome or is this not a palindrome, right? The answer is, if you reverse this thing, whatever you do to this thing, can you tell the difference? And the answer is, uh, no, not really. So it should be a palindrome, right? And so this is one of the reasons why we wanted a uh, null string to be a palindrome, because you see here, this had an even number of letters. So we got down to AA, and then it called it on the blank string, and then the blank string returned true. So that's, that's what we want. Um, So, you know, basically, if we do something like this, whoops, let's not do that. What we're going to see is that it's going to strip off the first two, strip off the second two, strip off the third two, strip off the fourth two, and then finally gets here to ba, right? So here B doesn't match with A, so it's not a palindrome. All right? So... You know, again, there's an iterative solution to this, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, you could you could do that. That that is basically the iterative solution. So the iterative palindrome solution um, on a string is basically this. It's for um, i in range when a string if 
a string i is not equal to a string. And now here's the thing that you have to know. It's a string of len of a string uh, minus 1 minus i. And you'll have to figure out why that indexing is correct. And that's because, remember, the last index in a, in a list or a string is always the length minus 1. And yeah, you can short it to length over 2. But I do not care. Right? I don't care. Um, so this will also do the job. So uh, the point is, the point is that there is an iterative solution to the process, right? There is a way to do it. You're just comparing the string at i with the string at basically i from the end. So you go i in, go i from the end, compare them. If they're not equal, you return false. If they, and then if it never returns false, if it scans through the whole string and doesn't return false. Um, so we used to not allow the. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe maybe it's still forbidden. So it could be that this is, uh, uh, might be for, forbidden. I forget. But yes. If it were allowed, then you could just say if a string uh, is equal to a string uh, return true. So, but the thing to remember is that this is this is kind of the right solution in Python, uh, but most languages don't have this feature. So the point is that uh, the the reason why we don't teach this stuff is because um, just doesn't exist in a lot of languages. And actually, secretly, um, it's it's really what it's actually doing is something that's more like the above. Because this is hiding. So let me just say that this, this colon colon minus one business is actually hiding a for loop. Okay, basically what it's doing is it's just doing exactly this. I think it's basically exactly doing this for loop secretly under the surface. It's reversing the string and then testing it one by one in a for loop. And so um, that's the reason why we usually, I usually show this solution rather than this solution just because it, um, well, eh, let's not even talk about cleaner. Um, let me promise you that the more uh, slices you do like this in your in your Python, uh, the less readable uh, your code will be overall. Um, it it has to, you have to use it. It basically has to be like uh, you have to use it sparingly. Uh, you know, don't don't make all your code into this. Um, okay. All right, so I think that's it for today. Uh, maybe next time we will talk about things. Um, okay, so where do we leave off today? Let's check. Helper functions, binary search, and then I think we'll do uh, the Sierpinski's triangle example. Okay. So yeah, but I mean, the only thing to say is that this isn't a slice, right? This is indexing. So no slices are going on here. This is doing a slice. Um, 
I'm not sure. I think I, I'm gonna have to think about what I'm gonna do on Wednesday. I might either do recursion two or I might do classes and file IO. It's likely that I'm gonna do classes and file IO just because I need to put it somewhere and you know it's somewhere. Also you can have a little bit of extra time to think about recursion. All right. I think that's it for today.